Chris began his acknowledgments for his dissertation with a revealing half joke that all his research queries derive from a single question he asked himself as a child. Why do we drive for half an hour past so many churches to go to that church? This simple but poignant question stayed with him, steering him towards ethnography as a way to unravel the complex entanglements of ethnicity and religion in the lives of contemporary Armenians, an endeavor that has allowed him to reevaluate the role of that church, the Armenian Apostolic Church, and the Armenian theological tradition in the 21st century. His early ethnographic calling had to withstand some delay, however. It first took him to the altar, and then to the deaconship of the Armenian Apostolic Church. Chris defended his dissertation entitled Theology and the Community, the Armenian Minority Tradition and Secularism in Turkey, last summer from the Department of Anthropology at the University of Chicago. At the center of his research is another question as profound as it is simple. Why would a staunchly explicitly self-identified secular state, such as Turkey, nevertheless continue to identify so many of its ethnic minorities in primarily religious terms? This is not a question that applies solely to Turkey and its specifically Ottoman legacy. It also applies more broadly and with increasing intensity to European countries as well countries such as France, Germany, and the Netherlands, the non hole countries, <laughs> and highlights some of the historical tensions in the concept of minority itself, and how its development is critically bound up with the history of secularism. In exploring these tensions, Chris's project goes to the heart of the instabilities and possibilities that structure contemporary secular states. One central way in which these tensions play out, according to Chris, is through debates and negotiations and struggles over political representation. The basis on which a minority community is defined will have profound influence on who can, who can or who cannot represent it which aspects of minority life are appropriate for political representation, and consequently, what kind of control representatives can have over and within the communities they represent. That is why Chris's primary site of research in Istanbul, the Armenian Patriarchate and the Hran Dink Foundation, with its associated newspaper, Agos, have been so appropriate for exploring his research question. While challenging each other, both sites are important centers of Armenian community life, even as they have different relations with the broader Turkish population and the state. Today, you will hear how Chris is able to draw on his expertise in Armenian, and more gen generally in the Eastern Orthodox exegetical and hermeneutical tradition, to deftly highlight important contrasts with those forms of Christian hermeneutics that have historically given impetus to modern secular practices of political <coughs> representation. In the process, he produces fascinating insights full of promise for the study of social theory. Please join me in welcoming Chris. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you for that lovely introduction. It's always nice to hear other people describe your work. You think, hey, man, did I say that? That's great. Um, so I, I appreciate that very lovely introduction. Um, and you know, I generally, I want to start by saying thank you to Catherine and the rest of the uh, Armenian Studies program here, Naira especially, um, for, for having me this year. It's an incredible, lovely opportunity. Um, this this uh, Armenian sort of studies intellectual circle, if if you're not a part of it, um, you should be jealous because it's a really lovely and invigorating little uh, group of us. And I've, I've just been um, really thrilled to get to be a part of it this year. So I, I want to say thank you for that. 
Um, I also want to extend my thanks to the Department of Anthropology and to Andrew Shyrock, who's hosting me. Um, my office is in uh, one of the great anthropology departments, and I'm incredibly thankful for that opportunity also. Um, thank you to all of you who uh, came out today. It's a nice sunny day at least, so um, that's, that's a nice, nice thing for us. <clears throat> so let me begin. Thank you. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. So ubiquitous in Istanbul, the azan, or the call to prayer, was a five times daily feature of my life during fieldwork. Many of us I know have lived or worked in Muslim-majority countries where the azan likewise is a central aspect of daily life. One can become inundated to it, hearing but not listening. Yet when we do pause to listen, how do we listen? Do we listen for the words, contemplating the greatness of God in a mode one theorist called semantic listening? Or perhaps, if we're trained musicians, we listen for the patterns between notes to discern a musical mode, in this case, the makam ushak. Maybe we simply let the sounds reverberate within ourselves. While our experience of music, what we could call a phenomenology of sound, might take these different forms, it becomes vastly more difficult to talk about this experience, let alone to theorize music, sound, or the spaces and places shaped in part by music and sound without resorting to the trope of reading. We fall back on the words of the aeson or other lyrical music to interpret and to decode the meaning of the words. In this case, reading can be taken literally. And if there are no words, while many analyses of music and sound in the past couple decades have made strides towards ways of writing and thinking about the experience of sound, much work has and still does depend on a conception of interpreting instrumental or other non-lyrical music. Here, reading becomes a metaphor. We read into sound and music to interpret its meaning. For instance, we know that certain of Shostakovich's symphonies are about the great battles of World War II, that love in its various forms is the topic of nearly every single song, and that we can interpret compositions based on the personal history of the composer. In all these cases, we listen in order to interpret, usually with a model of reading rather than listening. When we turn to the spaces and places filled with music and reverberating with sound, we also often apply the metaphor of reading. We can interpret a landscape, or as Richard Leppert puts it, we can read the sonoric landscape. In our encounters not only with texts, but music, visual arts, and even space and landscape, our dominant inclination is to interpret and to read. In fact, this tendency to interpretation as dominant mode of engagement has become so ingrained that the editor of the Hermeneutics Reader, a collection of essays by prominent philosophers describing methods of hermeneutics, or interpretation, can say that hermeneutics has become the method of the social sciences. In other words, for many social scientists, the stated goal of our intellectual endeavors is interpretation, and specifically, a mode of hermeneutics modeled on long-standing, usually Christian, practices of reading and exegetical commentary. There have been, especially in recent years, important attempts to consider the social scientific endeavor apart from interpretation. Within anthropology, one of the strongest of these voices has been Talal Assad's, providing a genealogy of the concept of ritual in anthropology and related social sciences he looks to medieval Christian monastic practices as an example of what we are inclined to call ritual, but which does not conform to our expectations of ritual. For ritual, he says, has come for us to mean largely symbolic behavior, something that can be read. Yet the medieval monk, copying manuscripts and attending daily liturgical services, does not see the liturgy primarily in symbolic terms or as a practice in need of interpretation. Rather, the point of liturgy for the monk is the cultivation of virtues through disciplined attention to the body. In other words, it's not that monks were unable or never did conceive of their practices through symbolic behavior in need of interpretation. We'll see some of these practices. But rather that as social sciences looking at something, scientists looking at something like liturgy, our best descriptions of the practice would attend to disciplinary structures, the modes of personal cultivation, and the virtuous selves that were the intended result of ritual practices. 
The interpretive impulse that animates much of, the contemporary, of much of contemporary social science, the same impulse that compels us to read the Aizan and the soundscape of Istanbul then, is only one possible mode of science, social scientific engagement. Perhaps this is obvious, but I'd argue that despite several decades of practice theory, attention to the body, and attempts to overthrow a Cartesian duality now oft maligned, those of us engaged in the social sciences not only are overwhelmingly drawn to an interpretive practice, but in fact a mode of interpretation that is heavily influenced by a single tradition of hermeneutics. During my fieldwork, it took a radically different mode of listening to the Aizan to shock me into seeing this insight, and to begin asking how we might approach music, soundscapes, and ethnographic or historical data more broadly in a different way. One day, sitting in the beautiful, near the beautiful little brick chapel on the grounds of Surpurgic Armenian Hospital in Istanbul after Badarak, the Armenian liturgy, the muezzin began to recite the azan from a nearby mosque. One of my companions, particularly well versed in the liturgy and the music of the liturgy, asked the resident choir master, the hoja, to use the Turkish honorific, if the azan was in the Armenian liturgical mode the sign, Tagen. When the Hoja replied in the affirmative, I felt a wave of confusion. I'd never imagined that an Armenian liturgical mode could exist outside the walls of the church. I never considered the possibility of hearing a sign in the call to prayer, of using one liturgical tradition to engage with another in such a visceral way. Yet when we listen, <laughs> I think we can hear the similarities. My mind reeled. Was this translation from one system to another, an attempt to reappropriate space, a mode of listening, a kind of interpretation of the Aizan? My confusion surrounding that moment of listening, what kind of reading it was, if at all, led me to consider the modes of engagement that might be present in the Armenian theological and historical and liturgical tradition and to consider those potential modes of engagement as not just ethnographic material or data, but as a kind of theoretical and social scientific engagement in its own right. In the rest of my talk, then, I'm going to turn away from the specifics of this ethnographic example and the questions of sound and Armenian hymns, which is actually my extended advertisement for the March 16th and 17th. If you want to hear me talk about the details of the music, you've got to come back on March 16th. Uh, and instead, I'm going to turn towards the broader concern about how to engage with ethnographic or social scientific data. In addition to being extended advertisement, I began with this ethnographic moment because I believe sound and music lay out the concerns over interpretation in a very acute manner. Perhaps more so than with a text, music and sound raises the question of interpretation and hence of semiosis, that is the potential for a thing in the world to signify, which is, means that it can be interpreted in the first place. For sound and music, it, it seems, is grounded in the real in ways that words or other symbols are not. Part of what makes my companion's question is that tagen compelling, is that in a certain fundamental way, the combination of mo notes that make up the makam ushak and the sign tagen are the same. And we'll get some musical experts to dispute me, that's fine, we can <laughs> deal with that on March 16th. What do I mean then when I say that they're the same? Well, when we describe a note, take the note that anchors the piano, middle C, we can define it physically by frequency. In the case of middle C, 261.625565 hertz. Potentially, we can call that frequency whatever we want. In the same way, we can listen to the series of notes, each defined by their frequencies, and call that series makam ushak, or tsain tagen. But we're describing, relatively, the same series of frequencies. This is why the musical example is especially provocative for thinking about interpretation or about science and signification. If I tell you to think of a tree, our native Michiganders might think of their state tree, the eastern white pine. I, however, coming from the Central Valley, am going to think of the great sequoia trees. So when I give you the sign tree, it seems to pick out something different in the world. But when we say middle C, there's this relationship to the physical frequency that seems more direct. Now, I mean, again, there are musicologists who are going to argue with me about this point, but I think that our folk theory of this is the way that most of us are kind of uh, encountering this anyways. This sense that the sign tree is more ambiguous than the sign middle C. Uh, 
So this is why one of the this is one of there are a few reasons like this that I wanted to begin with the musical example. The first is just this question of precision in relation to the real. The second is that the radically different signs that result from the same set of notes, the makam and the sign, are each rooted in different musical traditions. Related is my friend's willingness to interpret the set of notes using her grounding in the Armenian liturgical tradition. This struck me not just as interpretation, but an embodied sensibility cultivated through liturgy, a mode of engagement that included what we immediately recognize as interpretation, but also something a little bit different. My friend not only read the Aizan in a way that seemed a little bit different than my usual social scientific sense of hermeneutics, but she encountered and experienced the Aizan in a manner grounded in the Armenian liturgical tradition. This has led me to ask, is there then a mode of Armenian Christian hermeneutics that would be appropriate for thinking about my ethnographic material with Armenians? And a further question, could such a mode of social scientific engagement be applicable beyond the specifics of the Armenian case? In a way, this is an old anthropological question. While my initial question is about a method, a mode of engagement different from the usual hermeneutics, the development of theories and concepts out of ethnographic material has a long and storied history in the discipline of anthropology. We can think, for instance, of Sigmund Freud's use of the concept taboo, which is a concept that first was written down by Captain Cook and was filtered through Fraser's The Golden Bough and becomes a sort of staple of anthropological literature that then becomes this like, I mean, everybody talks about taboo. It's originally, though, an anthropological concept. <coughs> Fetish, liminal states, my favorite one is moop, matter out of place. Anybody that's ever been to Burning Man knows what moop is. Um, while not originating in an anthropologist, was uh, popularized by Mary Douglas's Purity and Danger. So we have all of these concepts that in a way are ethnographic that take on a larger sort of theoretical purchase. Yet somehow in the past few decades, anthropology has become less of a theory generating discipline and instead turned toward importing theories. We often speak the language of power knowledge, difference, and hegemony more fluently than we do something like derin devlet or deruchun. What possibilities might emerge if ethnographic data was used not only comparatively, but as our theoretical concepts themselves. <laughs> How might we generate both theory and method out of the ethnographic data? And again, I, I just want to say that there are some anthropologists who would tell me this is what good anthropology has always done, this is what the comparative method is. Um, but I think to some extent, this kind of reliance on outside theory points to the fact that it's, it's worth trying to reinvigorate <laughs> this practice of sort of theory generation out of ethnographic data. And this is the possibility that I first heard in my friend's cultivated engagement with the Aizan, her mode of listening that didn't quite feel like the kinds of reading and interpretation I was used to. It led me to pursue the potential of Armenian sources, not just my own ethnographic material, but the long and robust canon of historical and theological texts to generate both social theory and methods. Why Armenian sources? What makes them so compelling? Beyond, of course, the obvious personal interest and even my ethnographic engagement. I'd like to suggest that Armenian theology and historical writing can generate a sense of the uncanny when placed next to the Western Christian or even Eastern Orthodox Christian tradition. Without delving into the reams of psychoanalytic pages written on the idea of the uncanny, I mean here simply that Armenian Christianity as Christianity appears at first sight very familiar to Western Christianity, but that there are in fact subtle differences which can unsettle the sense of familiarity. It's this uncanniness that makes the Armenian case so compelling the potential of the uncanny to unsettle some of the Western Christian foundations of our social scientific methods and theories is precisely what interests me in the Armenian theological material. Specifically, I want to turn to the uncanny resemblances and subtle differences in modes of interpretation. So one of the ways that this encounter with Armenian Christian sources is uncanny lies in the practice of interpretation and indeed the willingness to interpret. We're not, for instance, dealing with a population or a discourse that sees no distinction between words and things or has a radically different conception of semiosis that wouldn't allow for the kind of job of interpretation. We're not even in the realm of the epistemological anarchism of Farabend or even the measured insistence on the inapplicability of interpretation in certain cases that Talal Asad that we, we discussed uh, gives us. No, Armenian exegesis is absolutely an interpretive process. Recall in my friend's with encounter with the Aizan that she did not simply let the music reverberate in her. It was less a mystical experience than a willingness to interpret the recitation through her own liturgical tradition. In part, 
This is due to the common ancestry of Armenian Christian and Western Christian theology. Not only do I mean the obvious grounding in the Gospels, but that through the fourth century and including much of the fifth, the intellectual heritage was shared. The Cappadocian Fathers, Gregory of Nyssa's learned synthesis of the Greek rhetorical tradition and Christian thinking, influences of both Alexandrian and Antiochian modes of interpretation, all of these are shared intellectual inspirations across the ancient churches. Yet, rather than early diverge, yet the rather early divergence in the fifth century has led to some crucial differences, uncanny ones that unsettle the way that we think about signs, signification, semiosis, and in interpretation, exactly what many have seen as the heart of the social sciences. Let us then trace this separation in part to see how the divergence of Armenian theology, specifically I'm going to talk about Christology, theological discussions about the nature of Christ, results in this uncanny encounter between the sign theory and interpretation undergirding much social science and the hermeneutics of Armenian exegesis. We can begin, perhaps, with the Gospel of John, that is to say, in the beginning. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. This resounding passage opens the Gospel of John, with John forcefully answering the question, who is this person, Jesus Christ, with the clear answer, he is the Word of God. Word here translates Greek logos, a term with a long philosophical and theological use that John surely meant to invoke. When we take seriously John's identification of Jesus Christ with the word of God, the logos, we are led not only to Christological discussions about the nature of the person Jesus Christ, but into semiotics, the loosely cohesive study of signs and signification. Semiotics can encompass a narrower definition of linguistics as a science of language, recognizing other kinds of signs and signifying relations. Music, for instance. In addition to the concept of the logos, early Christian theologians also recognized the connection between Christology and sign theory in debates over iconoclasm, the value and morality of the use and veneration of religious painted icons, a controversy that played out mostly in the 8th and 9th century. John of Damascus, in his three treatises on the divine images, connects the veneration of icons to the incarnation of Christ, the moment of God becoming man. He says, I do not venerate matter. I venerate the fashioner of matter, who became matter for my sake and accepted to dwell in matter, and through matter worked my salvation. And I will not cease from referencing matter, through which my salvation was worked. John of Damascus reiterates that salvation comes through the incarnation of Jesus Christ, which is fundamentally an affirmation of the material world. And he describes the relation between the material and the spiritual, between the human and the divine nature of Christ, as it relates to a material image, the icon. As he states later, to deny the veneration of icons is to deny the incarnation of Christ. Here's a nice picture of iconoclasm here. So here with John of Damascus, we have an explicit connection between a representational logic of icons, a kind of semiotics, and not only the fact of the incarnation, but the details of relation between material and spiritual in the incarnation. It is these details to which I would like to turn, for while all Nicene Christians affirm the incarnation of Christ, they don't all agree on the details of it, or on the specifics of the nature of Christ once he was incarnated. It is in these differences, I suggest, that we might find the outlines of a different conception of the sign, of signifying relations, and of semiotics that is at the heart of this uncanny resemblance. First, I'm going to outline what I'll call Augustinian or Chalcedonian semiotics, and I'm going to take a look at how this compares to some of our social scientific elaborations of, of signs. And then I'm going to turn to the alternative Christology of the Armenian Church, which is shared with all of the so-called Oriental Orthodox churches. We'll call it Miaphysite Christology. And we'll see how maybe that gives us a kind of alternative semiotics. So that's our, our outline for the next little bit here. Augustine, the bishop of Hippo who lived 354 to 430, had an outsized influence on subsequent Western Christian and indeed Western thinking. For various reasons, though Armenians engage deeply with Augustine's predecessors, Armenian Christianity does not engage with Augustine or subsequent Western Christian thinkers for many centuries. So what one author has described as Western hermeneutics in the Augustinian tradition really is quite divergent from Armenian exegetical practices. <coughs> and crucially, Augustine's most developed thinking about signs in on-Christian teaching comes explicitly in the context of communicating certain rules for interpreting the scriptures. 
So the basis for both Western Christian exegesis of scripture and an Augustinian or Chalcedonian semiotics emerges at precisely the moment that Armenian Christianity diverges from Western Christianity. Augustine gives two separate definitions of science in, in De Doctrina Christiana on Christian teaching. At the beginning of book one, he defines a sign as those things which are employed to signify something. Okay? This is a dyadic relationship, two parts. One that recalls perhaps the Platonic theory of forms, or perhaps the Caesarean definition of a sign as that which holds together the signified and the signifier. This is a foundational uh, idea of linguistics and then of the structural linguistic that's influenced much of social theory throughout the 20th century. And we can sort of see that it's also a definition that's quite resonant with Chalcedonian Christology. In 451, at the Fourth Ecumenical Council, the definitive Western Christian elaboration of the nature of Christ defined Christ as one person, the person of Jesus, oh, I have a pointer, the person of Jesus Christ, human and divine nature. So two natures combined in one person. This dyadic sign relation, like the formula of Chalcedon, holds together the material and the human, the spoken, sensed, or slightly more complicatedly, the written word, and the spiritual, the divine, or the idea, the signifier, the signified rather, together to describe the essence of the whole, the sign, or the person, Jesus Christ. We can, I think, see the sort of similarities in the way that I've made these diagrams. This is straight out of the source book. The second definition, which Augustine gives at the beginning of book two, adds to this dyad a third term, namely mind. He says, for a sign is a thing which of itself makes some other thing come to mind, besides the impression that it presents to the senses. As with the first definition, signification begins with a dyad between two things. But here mind is invoked as that which recognizes or is able to perceive that two-part relation. Here, rather than Sassur, the definition finds resonance with the late 19th and 20th century philosopher C.S. Peirce. Uh, Marcus, in an appendix to his discussion of St. Augustine on signs, makes this connection explicit. He says, sign, representamen, object, subject, interpretant. This is Peirce's terminology, and it coincides closely with Augustine's. Peirce's definition of sign is equally close to that given by Augustine. A sign, or representamen, is something which stands to somebody for something in some respect or capacity. This is Peirce's famous trichotomy of signs. So you can just meditate <laughs> on that for a while. In drawing these connections, I don't want to suggest a strong causal correlation. Let me repeat. I don't want to be taken as saying that the Chalcedonian formula of two natures in one person determines Peirce's famous trichotomy of signs and that all of our semiotic theorizing is somehow inherently Chalcedonian. That's not my point. But I want to describe what I would call a resonance between Chalcedonian Christology and Augustinian sign theory. This sign theory then sets the terms of debate for much of the Middle Ages, and in many ways, Peirce's philosophy is still quite immersed in some of the scholastic thinking and categories. So Augustine really sets the terms of debate for how we think about signs and signification. If then, Western Christology is ultimately defined by the Council of Chalcedon resonates with Augustinian sign theory, then we can turn to the Christian East, beyond Byzantium, which also accepted Chalcedon, to the Armenian Apostolic Church and its sister churches, the other Oriental Orthodox churches, to interrogate the potential resonances between a different Christology and other ways of thinking about sign or image. As with the Eastern Orthodox churches, derived from the Byzantine tradition or the Roman Catholic Church, the Oriental Orthodox churches accept the first three ecumenical councils, Nicaea, Constantinople, Ephesus, but they reject the fourth council of Chalcedon, which is where this definitive Western Christological formula was set out. Instead, they are adherents of what is best described as Miaphysitism. Miaphysite Christology is most associated with Cyril of Alexandria, and it stresses the unity of Christ. And it asserts in a rather mystical formula that Jesus Christ is one nature, God and man, without mixing. Anybody one? It's a bit of a mystical formula. The elaboration of this foundational position in particular, the defense against the claim that it is a monophysitism, which denies either the divinity or the humanity of Christ, constitutes a significant amount of Miaphysite Christological writing. We can see already, given the assertion that we take seriously the possibility of reading Christology as semiotics, that a single nature that somehow mystically includes both divinity and humanity has a very different structure from a single person with two distinct natures. It looks real different than that. <coughs> 
The strong line that divides both divine human or signified signifier in the Saussurian model of the sign dissolves. It's not that the difference between them or even the ability to distinguish them is erased. Rather, it's that the relationship between divine and human, signified and signifier, is conceived of differently. My suggestion is that this different conception of the relationship has supported a subtly different sign theory, which itself undergirds alternative interpretive practices. So let's take a little bit more detailed look at this Miaphysite position. We'll do so with Stepanos Sunetsi, who we're going to encounter a little bit later also, who offers a nice succinct statement of the apostolic Armenian orthodoxy. He says, a Godhead, one in three and three in one. One of these three is the Father's word, who was born of the Father before all time in order to reconcile the creation with the Father, descending from heaven through the archangel's giving of the good news into the holy and spotless virgin. He became incarnate truly and was made God and man, just as he was true God. So also he became true man, a single nature of two without confusion and without division. Although he became incarnate, he was inseparable from the Father, bearing all human passions except for sin. So we see some differences between the Chalcedonian formula and this nice, uh, clear statement. You know, he gives it very clearly, a single nature of two without confusion or division. So the possibilities for conceiving the word, word as sign is a little bit different. In the same text, Sunitsi says, God himself was united with a body capable of suffering and thus shared in the suffering of humanity without the Godhead itself actually suffering. Through this idea of being united, we can get the beginnings of this alternate sign theory. We can suggest that rather than emphasizing the division between two things, sign and signified, and then contemplating how they relate, the Armenian emphasis on the process of uniting itself asks us to look at the moment where the two things come into contact with each other. Signification then is less about the pointing relationship between two things and more about the visceral, textured encounter of these two things. Indeed, because mixing is anathematized from the outset, the anxiety over the encounter between material and spiritual, between signified and signifier, such as, for instance, Webb Keen describes brilliantly in his book, Christian Moderns, this anxiety is less pronounced. So when we turn to a different author, Bertanus Kertog, an Armenian theologian arguing against iconoclasm, we see that his arguments against iconoclasm are subtly different from the ones that we saw with John of Damascus. To counter the suggestion that icon veneration is veneration of mere material, he says, he compares it to the, the veneration of the gospel, saying, when we prostrate ourselves before the gospel, or when we kiss it, we're not prostrating ourselves before the ivory and the paint purchased from barbarian countries, but before the word of the Savior, which is written upon the parchment. We can see this as an elaboration of the moment of unification or contact that Sunitsi describes. Again, it's only the presence of the word on the parchment and through the paint that allows for the possibility of signification. You need that material in a really sort of fundamental way. Both components are necessary, but to the Miaphysite theologian, the emphasis is placed on the unity of the word and material medium. In contrast to John of Damascus, who stresses a pointing relationship of material back to spiritual, Kertog offers the moment of unification of word with material, the process of inscription itself, and the mode by which the icon signifies. He's less concerned about the sort of pollution of the spiritual by the material, and is more concerned about affirming both the material and the spiritual. We don't want to debase either of them. If it seems like splitting hairs, it, it, it might be a little bit. Mm -hmm. Over the centuries, many have suggested the differences between the Chalcedonian Miaphysite uh, Christology or simply em emphasis or some arguments or even that it's bad translation. Yet the subtle differences have had important effects. And it's precisely the subtlety, that sort of hair splitting of the difference that creates the uncanny effect. The uncanny presupposes recognition. You have to recognize it somehow and then it's just barely off. So maybe it is splitting hairs. Where then might we begin to see these uncanny differences? To answer this, I return to the problem of interpretation that animated our initial encounter with the call to prayer. If in part due to differences in Christology, the conception of sign and semiosis, then we might also, by turning to Armenian interpretive works, tease out the details of an alternative hermeneutics. Given the centrality of hermeneutics to social scientific endeavor, hopefully this is no small result. And I've got some caveats, but for time, you can maybe you know, ask the questions that I was going to dodge, and then I'll you know, give you my pre-given answers there. Um, because I think the, the purchase comes not necessarily from the uniqueness of this position, but from two things. One, the unsettling effect that comes with an uncanny encounter that I've been mentioning, but also 
uh, the potential to use an indigenous, what anthropologists have called emic modes of interpretation to grapple with the ethnographic material. So I I'll turn to this idea a little bit at the very end. So what then does Miaphysite hermeneutics in the Armenian mode look like? And how might it differ from Western hermeneutics in the Augustinian mode, or dominant conceptions of social scientific interpretation? To offer some details, I'm going to look at three main sources. First, a commentary on the divine liturgy by the 8th century bishop Stephanos Sunetsi, who we just heard give us a nice Christological definition. Second, Gregory of Nareg's commentary on the Old Testament book, The Song of Songs. And finally, we'll end where we began, with music. This time considering a hymn from the morning service composed by Nersa Shnorhali, Ashkar Amenayim. So in the commentaries on the Armenian Badarak, the Divine Liturgy, we have an entire genre that speaks to different concerns. By a commentary on the liturgy, I don't mean the, the rites, the manuals that sort of tell you where to go and what to do, that's ubiquitous across Christendom. Rather, I'm talking about uh, a theological tradition that includes detailed exposition and commentary on both the words and the actions and the sensory encounter of the, that rite, of that ritual. As Father Daniel Findikian has noted, one of the features of the Armenian rite that must be considered truly distinctive is the relative wealth of medieval allegorical commentaries that have come down to us dealing with the various liturgical services and books. Besides commentaries on the divine liturgy, a genre known to all ancient Christian cultures, the Armenians add more than a dozen commentaries on the daily office, several on the lectionary, and two early allegories on the ritual of dedicating a church, all of these unknown or practically unknown in other Eastern rites. Unquote. Even in the basic fact of the genre, though, we can see a mode of exegesis that's willing to blur lines. Written uh, uh, interpretation already reaches out into the world, to the thing, not limited to the second order written sign that Augustine details, but to actions. This appears a little bit like certain kinds of the willingness of anthropology to interpret ritual, but I think um, we'll see how it's a little bit different than that, hopefully. In Sunitzi's text, as Findikian points out, every single element, every chapter, every action is interpreted through salvation history as a whole. By contrast to Origen and others, I'm quoting, Stepanos weaves together with great creativity the relevant scriptural passages into a unified narrative of salvation history. Thus, Stepanos interprets all biblical events that explicitly or by implication occurred at the same hour as being connected transtemporally in the divine scheme of salvation and as eschatologically linked in the daily office. What he means is that Sunetzi gives us, he'll, he'll look at something that happens in, say, the morning service and say, aha, in the first hour, God created this thing. And Jesus, you know, this happened to Jesus in the morning. And he combines all of these things into the fact that he's interpreting the, the morning, the sort of the third hour or office. This is what Findikian means here. So this unified vision, Findikian tells us, stands in contrast to the way Byzantine and other commentaries on the divine liturgy developed, where the tendency, again quoting, in Byzantine liturgical commentary was towards a gradual disintegration, such that the individual components of the liturgy come to reflect or image forth specific discrete moments of earth, Christ's earthly ministry. By contrast, Sunetzi finds the entirety of salvation history in every single component of liturgy. In this, Findikian suggests, Armenian exegesis is not so easily categorized as either Alexandrian or Antiochian modes of interpretation. This was the way of categorizing interpretation in the uh, early Christian church as either literal or allegorical. It doesn't quite fit. Likewise, the usual understanding of typological interpretation does not quite fit. If Jonah in the whale's belly for three days is a type for Christ's three days buried before the resurrection, the type has a clear interpretation and moreover a temporal fulfillment. Christ isn't the type of Jonah. Jonah is the type of Christ. In Sunetzi and much Armenian commentary, however, Christ and salvation history are the anchor, or as I'll say later, maybe the prism, and the ultimate meaning for any typological interpretation. But there's a more capacious, free associative play of types any repetition of three days is interpreted in light of the event of Christ's death and resurrection, whatever the location in time or history. So Armenian typology, as we'll see further with Gregory of Nareg, lacks the one-to-one -one correspondence of the classic understanding of a typological interpretation. Crucially, Findikian reads Armenian commentaries on the liturgy in light of the distinctive Christology of the Armenian church, which accords with what we've been saying so far. Yet while he emphasizes that these commentaries can serve as a heuristic for the Christological position of the church, I'm sort of turning that on, on its head. I'm saying we've got this 
Christological position that we see is different, and let's see what those commentaries do that are different. Let's see the sort of different modes of interpretation. An additional example from Sunetsi might be useful here. Commenting not only on the words of the Trisagion, an ancient hymn shared across many tr Christian traditions, but on the accompanying action of bringing the gospel around the altar in solemn procession, and I'm, I'm going to play this, but I'm going to keep talking because I'm running out of time. I'm going to be like one of these running commentaries, but, mm -hmm. but you know, don't get too distracted by, <laughs> by this here. So he comments not only on the words that you hear being sung, but on the action. So take a look at the actions as we listen to his interpretation, specifically focusing on the incense, which we'll see in an instance. instant. Here's his quote. Here also, the suffusion of the Holy Spirit, symbolized by the incense having come from the Father, taking us all up whence we had fallen. By this incense, we come to God's likeness, having become assimilated according to his image. And as we confidently process around the royal table with the seraphim, we issue the fragrant confession of the immortal one who was crucified for us. Burning with the divine love of glowing coals, they vie to proclaim, by means of true doctrines, the word of life and peace for the whole world and for the holy church, accordingly rising up to the first one by forming the image of the heavenly, heavenly Father to become fragrant vessels bearing Christ, like the Holy Virgin Mary, to sing praise to God and prayers in Jerusalem. Wow. A full unpacking of this dense theological passage, I think, could be a lecture or, or a sermon, I guess, in its own right. But at the very least, let's enumerate how many different things the incense symbolizes in that passage. At the very least, the Holy Spirit, divine love, and the Holy Virgin. Even more, the passage includes all three persons of the Holy Trinity, making a succinct statement about the relationship between God the Father and Christ. The passage suggests that incense helps us to sing with the angels in praise of God, and that the incense is a fragrant confession. It also effortlessly incorporates both the action happening during the liturgy, he says we confidently process around the royal table, and the words of the hymn sung, the immortal one who was crucified for us. Hence, in one dense and theologically sophisticated passage, we have a single item, image, or sign, the incense, interpreted in multiple ways. And we see not only the specific sign or component interpreted, but the contemporaneous actions and text being interpreted along with and in light of that first image. Sunitsi then not only interprets the incense, but shows us how incense helps to interpret other actions of the liturgy and to have all of it reflect back to salvation history and to our own lives. Incense is both interpreted and an interpretive aid for other simultaneous sensory inputs. This robust and capacious set of interpretations flowing in and out of the world, appealing to our senses, using our senses to aid in further interpretations, suggests a hermeneutic model that is latticed and expansive rather than a pointing relationship. With the sensorial multinodal interpretive process, while this sensorial multinodal interpretive process should appear quite different from the kinds of interpretation we might be more familiar with, it does bear some resemblance both to the, the polysemy of the sign and what has become seen as the standard fourfold medieval interpretive mode. In contrast to the Alexandrian and Antiochian, that is the allegorical and literal model which has been used to describe the early Christian church, there's a sort of consensus that what happened after Augustine was this four, fourfold interpretation, right? So things can be interpreted historically, allegorically, anagogically, or tropologically, and this is a, a classic example there that I've put up. This seems to suggest an openness to multiple interpretations that I'm saying might be a little bit distinctive of the Armenian tradition, so let me clarify. First, I think in the example of Sunetsi, we, we, we clearly have something different than simply multiple interpretations. It's not just that he's interpreting multiple things, it's all of these connections that he makes. More importantly, I would also suggest that the fourfold interpretation, while allowing for several interpretations, still leaves the basic signified signifier Stein structure intact. In general, there aren't multiple historical, analogical, tropological, what I forget, historical interpretations. There's one of each of them. Right, so you get four interpretations, sure, you get multiple interpretations, but it's still not a sort of overflowing multiple interpretation. There's still a correct historic interpre interpretation. It's not that you know, the historical Jerusalem is also the historic Antioch. No, you have a correct historical interpretation. So it keeps this sort of one-to-one -one structure intact, even as it allows for a little bit more play. So another characteristic 
of Western hermeneutics in the Augustinian mode, as I mentioned above, is the unidirectionality of interpretation. So in Caesarean terms, terms, the signified points to the signifier, while the signifier gives meaning to the signified, right? Jonah is the type of Christ, not the other way around. There's a unidirectionality. We can see this dominant directional trend in the interpretation of tropes of types, right? The sign of Jonah. In this unidirectional and importantly temporally unidirectional understanding of type or trope, the meaning is secured and the sign structure is clear. By contrast, with Gregory of Nareg's beautiful and mystical interpretation of the Song of Songs, we can discern why Findikian feels that this classic idea of typological interpretation doesn't quite accurately describe Armenian exegetical modes. I'll briefly comment on just one passage that hopefully clarifies the difference. Beginning his exegesis of chapter 3, verses 9 to 10, Narigatse writes, I have often said that Solomon signifies Christ, for he was from the offspring of David, and a king who judged justly and made peace and built a temple. Nonetheless, the words which concern him are few, while those concerning Christ are many, for he is the root of David, and king of heaven and earth, and more just in judgment, and merciful, and the occasion of peace for the whole earth, removing from the world, world idolatry and the discord between heavenly things and earthly. Thereby, all the earth was made into the temple of God through Christ, transforming the type with its king and temples into the truth, which is the church. What's happening here? On the one hand, we have a unidirectional temporal typology of the same as Jonah and Christ, right? Solomon is a type for Christ. Yet the fulfillment of the type in Christ, rather than being the end of signification and the last word on the typological relation, does something different. The temple, also a type, is expanded into the earth so that the whole world, all of God's creation, functions like a temple. But Christ's incarnation and coming into the world, transforming the world, also transforms the type, Nadeg says. So the earth as temple now becomes the church, which Gregory identifies with the truth. So we have, as with standard typological interpretation, the fulfillment of the type and the anchoring of the type in Christ. Yet the moment of fulfillment is also a moment of transformation. The earth temple as type is now the locus of an overflowing, abundant, and capacious, capacious truth, the person of Jesus Christ. This truth, which Gregory identifies with the church, and we can also identify with Christ, who is the, the body, you know, the church is the body of Christ, anchors interpretation, but it does not conclude it. Our image, our sign, our type, the earth temple, becomes a repository for truth and the site and source of truth and knowledge. Rather than a single interpretation, we have something more like a prism. Typological relationships refract a type through the prism of truth, scattering the single image like monochromatic light into colorful abundance. Between Sunetsi and Naragatsi, then, we have two new images to help us consider Armenian exegesis, the lattice and the prism. Lattice-like, Armenian hermeneutic methods reach and stretch from text to action to life to image, tracing multiple connections and multiple directions between them. The text of the hymn helps us to understand what incense does, while further meditation on the incense, and in fact it bears emphasizing our sensorial encounter with the incense in the church, helps to interpret the text. We're constantly tacking back and forth between signified and signifier in a web of connections that reinforces the entire structure of interpretation. This is the first point and unique aspect of Armenian hermeneutic that I want to highlight. The second emerges through the metaphor of the prism. A single image or type has multiple interpretations, but only, one, only because those types are refracted through the prism of truth, in the Armenian case, Christ. If Christ is the fulfillment of types, the typological interpretation doesn't end there. Christ as prism, rather than anchor, recognizes that the light of a single image may illuminate many different situations, as we may find useful. And it's this usefulness that I want to highlight as the final characteristic of Armenian hermeneutics today. To do so, I turn to Nersa Schnorhali and end where we began with music. This is uh, where Nersa was writing these hymns. <coughs> Ashkar Amenayn, one of Schnorhali's acrostic hymns, is found in the night office, the first early morning of the daily offices. Even regular churchgoers in America probably don't hear this hymn very often. In the complex calendrics of the Armenian Apostolic Church, on Sundays, another beloved acrostic of Shnorhali's, Aravod Luso, is sung. They're written in the same meter, but Ashkara Menayin is sung on penitential days. So the meter and the melody may be familiar to some, but the more unfamiliar words are decidedly penitential in nature. I thought about singing, but I'm just not going to do it. 
why. Because I'm a little, you know. People of the world, or all the world, the hymn opens. Look at me with compassion as the singer goes on to proclaim herself a sinner. The exegetical mastery of Narcissus' hymn is immediately apparent in its multiple interpretive possibilities. From the very first word, Ashkar, we can tread along at least two separate interpre interpretations via the starting point of lexical variation. Dr. Roberta Urban translates Ashkar as gathering to highlight the polyvalence of the term, but the first and most common dictionary definition is just world, so that the first two lines would read the entire world which is gazing at me. If then we begin our interpretive journey from a conce conception of Ashkar as world, the path continues along a broadly penitential hymn of lamentation where the singer confesses sins with the whole world looking on. Along this road, we encounter at the end of the second line the word pokokel, which we would hear as to protest or to complain. So the verse ends, I complain against myself or I protest against myself. Yet we can, from the very first word, set out along a different path. Ashkar also has a technical legal meaning which we could translate as assembly or, or maybe jury to give a kind of uh, looser translation that gets the meaning. For the learned listener, perhaps a monastic student who has recently finished a course on canon law, the realization that this penitential hymn can have a more restricted interpretation, replete with the visual image and embodied experience of standing before the assembly and judgment, i.e. the altar, and it, it's worth noting that actually um, terms for the Armenian church are courtroom terms. So the, 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 the term for the bema, uh, comes from the same as the, the judge's bench. Mm -hmm. So this monastic student that understands this is, is sort of feeling himself in the courtroom as he stands before the altar and takes on this interpretive road. So it leads to a different set of associations and ex exegetical possibilities. On this route, when we encounter Povokel in the second verse, we hear not, I complain to myself, but I accuse myself, since the word can likewise be used in a technical legal sense of to accuse legal terminology. The brilliance of the hierarch who surely earned his epithet grace-filled is apparent in these multiple interpretations. To these two, we can add at least a third that Dr. Irvin has discerned, a more private lament by St. Narcissus about his brother, who was Catholicos <coughs> before him and whose death greatly affected him. Yet what I want to emphasize is not merely the multiple interpretations, the refraction through the prism that we've already explored. Rather, I want to linger on the question of who will discern these various levels on whose eyes each newly hued ray falls. The courtroom or legal interpretation is simply not accessible to the average worshiper. The technical legal vocabulary is not available and there's no grounding in canon law in the courtroom architecture of the church. But I want to dissuade us from considering this a form of Gnosticism, right, that says only the initiated, initiated have access to certain knowledges or interpretation. Rather, I'd frame these multiple interpretations around what we can call spiritual usefulness. The courtroom interpretation will add little to the spiritual development of someone who does not have the entire framework of canon law available to support it. What good does it do? What spiritual growth could it possibly nurture for someone merely to know that Ashkar also means jury? The interpretation becomes nourishing, spiritually useful, only for a particular category of listener. The point is not to exclude, but to edify accordingly. With such a concept of spiritual usefulness or edification as a guide to the exegetical methods of Armenian theology, there's an explicit connection here between hermeneutics and ethics. And it's this ethical tinge, this insistence on usefulness of interpretation, that I want to highlight as a third and final distinctive character of Armenian hermeneutics. So let me end then by recapping these three characteristics and maybe offering a word or two about what I think I've done, and then we can talk about that in, in questions. So these three sort of characteristics of the Armenian exegetical literature that give a, an uncanny quality when placed next to Western hermeneutics in the Augustinian mode are our usual modes of doing social scientific interpretation. First, it's lattice-like quality. Armenian exegesis often moves between text, image, activity, and world. It traces out numerous connections in multiple directions. Not only does an element of liturgy like incense need to be interpreted, but careful meditation on that element also helps us to interpret other things. Text and life, signified and signifier, are not so separate. Second, Armenian hermeneutics in a miaphysite mode is like a prism, where a single image, type, or sign is refracted through the fulfillment of types, the truth that is Jesus Christ. Now this conception of capital T truth integral to the way an image is interpreted as a refraction through a prism 
might be the characteristic that's most distant from our postmodern present. Though thinking about exegetical prisms and anchors may be a productive corrective to epistemological nihilism, and we could maybe uh, imagine a, a sort of less apologetic, less theological prism. Finally, Armenian interpretation always proceeds with a notion of usefulness, specifically spiritual usefulness, though we can easily see how the ethical and relational results of focusing on the value or usefulness for the individual listener or reader can be generalized beyond spiritual usefulness. Can conclude with a different question of usefulness. It strikes me that deploying some of these hermeneutic techniques in our work as social scientists dealing with Armenians, especially if we work at all with the Armenian church, is itself a compelling and ethical mode of engagement. We'll miss the nuance and the point of actions, activities, or texts dealing with Armenians if we're not willing or able to grapple with the modes of signification with which that Armenian material might be operating. And beyond work with Armenians? I hope that these three characteristics of Armenian hermeneutics I've highlighted today and their grounding in an alternative idea of science and signification might be useful in a broader social scientific conversation about interpretation and method. All right, let her rip. And also, you'll notice that my, my promise of the thing had a whole separate uh, thing about the political theology. So if you came for the political theology, sorry, I totally duped you. Um, <laughs> I talked about that quite recently at a workshop. And, and to be honest, this was, this was more than enough material. So if you are interested in that, we can, I think, you know, talk about how it, it also serves as an example of what I'm trying to do here. Um, but I, I think this was more than enough for one day. Given us a lot to think about. <laughs> So the floor is open, and why don't you take your questions? Deal. Maybe the first brave one. Yes. I, I have one. Thank you for this wonderful and exhaustive interpretation of Armenian historians. I've just so enlightened, and uh, my, my, my questions are still quite, in, quite irrelevant to the, to the oral interpretations. But as a Bolshoi, as an Islamic Armenian, tempted to ask this question that whether um, this whole tradition, this whole specific, very particular Armenian Christology um, it can be also related to the um, compartmental system hmm. in the contemporary times because you must be fam familiar with the, with the specific uh, musical um, composition uh, composed and invented by uh, Hampasin Mondrian, mm -hmm. an Armenian Use that basically for the transcription of the Armenian church music. But later on, we know that as far I'm not a musical expert, you know. But as far as I know, that uh, very system was also used for the uh, composition of tur Turkish music mm -hmm. too. So that was uh, the major reason that uh, the <coughs> Ezan, the Turkish uh, religious music had so much resemblance with the Armenian church music. But, and I know that not uh, in any uh, Muslim country uh, do share the same thing, uh, having the, the, this, sort of a, um, uh, this sort of a system. So I know that many people from other Muslim worlds in the Middle East or in the, in the East at large, they, they, they feel themselves at loss when they hear the Azan in Turkey. So, uh, coming to my question, how do you fit that special musical alphabet really uh, in, in your research, in your explaining that, that Armenian Christology has this very uncanny role in, in, uh, really in, in, in its dialogue with the Western Christian system? That's, a, that's an interesting, that's a, that's a fun question. Um, and. Again, I encourage everybody to come back for more music on March 16th. Maybe just a broken record of an advertisement here. Um, and so, so just you know, briefly, what, what Marlon is talking about is that um, before any of the Armenian hymns that we see notated like this um, were notated, there is in the sort of textual tradition a set of what are called chaz notes that are just sort of give you the shape of the music. Um, and the, the use of these notes was sort of lost over time. And in the 19th century, this, this Hampartsum Limogian in, in Turkey um, kind of used those chaz notes to create a new system of notation. And it was the first way, you know, decades before anybody had transcribed these hymns using Western musical notation, they were notated in this manner. And, and as Marl notes, 
Um, it was also the first transcription of a lot of um, various Anatolian and Turkish folk music. Um, now, I, I don't know actually these, these questions and claims about kind of the, the influence either direction. I'm, I'm always, I'm, I'm not going to stake anything out on the kind of, um, you know, which way have these musical traditions influenced each other. You know, I, I, I think that there are two traditions that have been side by side with each other for a long time, and I would, I would uh, totally affirm that the fact that the Hampartsum notation was used to notate some of these things probably influenced the way that they have developed since then. That, that I, I think you're, you're totally right in that. You know, a longer set of interactions between them, I, I, I don't know, and I'm, I, you know, as a not musical historian, I'm going to keep, you know, a sort of 10-foot, you know, distance from that. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the, other, the other interesting thing that, you, that you've mentioned, so what, what um, my, my friend heard, right, when she hears Tagen in what is the noon call to prayer, um, the reason that she can hear that is because in Turkey, and, and you're right, only in Turkey as far as I know, the call to prayer changes mode throughout the day. So when I actually, my, my advisor uh, lives and works in Egypt, and I'm telling him this, and he's like, he's like, I know I'm a drummer, but like, I think I could hear the difference. He's like, no, the azan is the same. And I'm like, no, man, like it's different. He's saying it's different. Every, like the morning one is different. He's like, no, it's the same. And I like looked it up, and eventually we, we were we were both right. You know, thank you. That's good. Um, that in Turkey they they cycle through each of the five uh, each of the five calls to prayer is is sung in a different mode. So that's that's what you're referring to. That there's this sort of difference um, there between them. So that's part of why she can hear uh, the differences in mode because there there are differences in mode. Um, now as to the the. The, the overall question about kind of how it relates to the, the Christology, I'm, I'm not totally sure. Um, I don't, I mean, can you, can you maybe clarify like what you're, what you're thinking there? Because I'm not like, I mean, I know, like, it, it, like this, this tendency towards notation maybe has something to do with it, right? The inscription, right? So we've got a sort of another order of um, kind of signification there. Um, but I, I don't, I don't, I mean, what, what like, I mean, what do you think, like, yeah, Christologically? As I said, I, I can't even recall certain, I mean, I don't know what to call it, musical term, but still, when we think about the classical musical notation, we can characterize the Armenian and this Hamparsumian uh, musical notation system as a kind of particular sort of alphabet. Mm -hmm. that really forms both in the church and in, in, in the mosque. So I in see. That sense, I, I see. I, I like that. I will. I will think about that and elaborate, and I will cite you when I talk about it because I, I think. I think what I what I in part what I hear you saying is that the very fact that the Hampartsum notation can notate these these two systems that are straddling both inside and outside the church gives us this sort of dual in one kind of quality to it. Right. That's cool. I like that. I, I that that makes sense to me. I mean, I I don't know. You know, I mean, one of the sort of, you know, joys of maybe interpretation in the Armenian mode is that that's a totally fair interpretation, and I find it very useful. Um, yeah, I, I like that. I'd have to think about that more, but I, I think you're right, that there's, there's definitely something in the fact that Hampartsum, I mean, perhaps part of why this person is even able to conceive of the correspondences between the Azan and the Tsain is because, in fact, the Hampartsum notation already sort of inscribes them as being similar. I, I think that that could totally be true. I like that. Thank you, Harry. Add to what you said about the Hampartsum notation. The and I'm not an expert on this by any means, but from what I understand, um, Hampartsum's notation involves seven signs equivalent to you know A through G of the Western scale. But there, in 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 Turkey, in Ottoman modes, every uh, <coughs> note is not necessarily um, on the same degree. For example, in a Rast uh, mode, which is basically a major scale, the third degree is, is slightly 
higher skill, starting at A, um, the second note is of, of B, and um, <coughs> which is the third note of Ras, but in the same simple, in Hamburg you know that, but in, in Ushak, it's even lower, because just by practicing Turkish folk music, Ushak, the second note of Ushak is played lower than the third note in Ras, even though they're both uh, B. So, um, you have to read the Hamburg to know that you have to know which Makam you're in, or which sign in Armenian church music you're in, and then you're able to read what those notes are saying and what tones they're making. So you have to already know what, what mode you're in, and then and then those tones are just a guide to, to guide you to the uh, uh, melody. That helps with what we're talking about. Uh, right. No. And I, right. So so part of what, what part of what Harry's talking about, right, is that that what we're looking at here describes what what has come to be called a well-tempered musical system. Right, so well tempered in that you know it corresponds to the piano. Right, you can't get in between notes when you play the piano, unless it's out of tune. Right, <laughs> but in in these both the makams and the signs, it's it doesn't it doesn't fit exactly right. Right, so there are what to the well tempered scale are in between or quarter tones, but a lot of people don't like that because it, it sort of reaffirms the hegemony of the Western you know notation here. Um, you know, is, is describing um, slightly different notes. And then I, I didn't know what you were, what you were saying also, that, that in a way, right, the, the modes are going to help determine the way that we read the notes just as much as vice versa, um, which I think, um, again, that nicely, I mean, I'm, I'm just like collecting good metaphors for, for what, I'm, what I'm saying here, right? Exactly. I mean, this is the kind of, that in the same way that incense interprets and, and is interpretable, it's nice in a way to think that we could have a nice, well-tempered you know, notation of a sign or an approximation of one, but that actually to, to really do it, to really live it, you've got to sort of embody it, right? You've got to start out with the sign in order to even you know, get to the right makam, right? Otherwise, you're, you're in Rost instead of Ushak. Cool. Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you very much for your presentation, um, Chris. I have another question, aside from both your musical and the texts that you offered to corroborate your argument. And it's what you presented, imagery and art. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm so happy that you both cited, you cited both Vertanes Kertol and St. John of Damascus, and you kind of did it in a flip-flop uh, notion uh, or arrangement because uh, Bertanes, um, I believe and suggest, inspired Damascus later. Uh, my question is, in the images that you showed, there were Eastern imagery, iconography, mm -hmm. and Western paintings. Mm. Uh, to what extent does art impact Christology and Thank you, thank you, Dai. That's a that's a that's a great uh, that's a really great question. And I should first just say that um, my my choice of uh, images is lost, often largely dictated by public domain um, and what I could easily <laughs> grab and that, so. gra you know grab and put up there. Um, but but your your question is really um, you know really speaks actually to the heart kind of what what I'm getting at, right? Because you know part of um, the sort of Eastern iconographic tradition is about certain ideas about representation, right? It's about certain ways of, of doing the signifying, right? That, that the arrangement, right? I mean, for instance, you know, uh, I, I can't, but a, a very well-educated person can walk up to any icon and know who it is because of the way they're turned and what they're carrying. Right? So the, the mode of signification is, is way different. You know, the, our sort of way of looking at art, you know, especially this kind of, you know, whatever, post-old masters kind of you know, strong mimetic uh, goal of art is very different. Right? So you know, a, a long tradition of Eastern iconography is not really interested in that kind of mimesis. Right? It's interested, rather, in telling us something through other kinds of, of modes. Right of signifying differently, whereas whereas you know our our you know Rubens for instance is is you know much more interested in a kind of you know accuracy right I mean like look at the sort of the forehead details right I mean we've got different kinds of goals in in the representation right um, and and I I think um, 
I think wholeheartedly, you know, what my, my thing that I keep coming back to is, is uh, resonance, is what I like to say. Because in a way, it gets me off the hook of claiming any kind of causal relation, right? Because I don't feel comfortable saying, you know, Miaphysite Christology determines the artistic output of the Armenians. I, I just, I don't, I don't feel comfortable saying that. But what I will say is that it sure makes a lot of sense that certain kinds of artistic representations are found within certain you know, types of exegetical and Christological understandings. So I, I like this idea of resonance. So that's, that's my sort of um, basic answer, right? I think you're, you're absolutely right to point to these differences because they're, they're trying to signify, they're trying to, to be, inter you, you interpret them in different ways. And I think you're absolutely right that they, they sort of correspond to different ways of doing interpretation, of you know, thinking about the relationship between the material and the spiritual, to Christology, all of these things you know, sort of line up in a row. You know, again, what I would call resonance as, again, a way of sort of you know, slyly getting away from, from making a causal claim. Mm -hmm. Michael. That, I, thank you. That's a really good question. I like that. Um, I mean, my, my initial inclination, right, so I think, I mean, maybe other people have said it, but Toal Asad says, you know, all interpretation is authoritative interpretation, right? So this is where we talk about kind of, you know, the, 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 the prism of the, the, the truth that is Christ, right? There, there is a sense that there is, I mean, you know, for, for Nareg, that, that prism was, was not just Christ, but was the church also. I think that's important that he says that. that. That gives us a sense of the fact that, you know, interpretations are sort of authoritatively filtered through, through the church in this case. So, you know, in a way, what I think you're saying, right, is that on the one hand, we have a certain kind of, like, Schnorhalim has certain meanings in mind, right? He, he, he's encoding these multiples. I think, though, that he would be okay with somebody taking something else out of it as long as it was spiritually edifying. So I, I think that um, my inclination is to say that, that an idea of spiritual usefulness or edification um, is more about the, the reader, in a sense, the, the interpreter. Um, now, in a way, it becomes the, the job of the person doing the interpreting, right? So if you read, um, I, I almost included, but I didn't, there's some really great passages in, in Nadeg's um, Song of Songs commentary about the role of the Vartabed, the, 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 the priest scholar. And one of the things the Vartabed is supposed to do is, um, it's great, the, 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 the physical image is not the, the mind or the head, the, the, the body piece that corresponds to the Vartabed is, is the jaw, the mandible, because what the Vartabed does is he, he chews it up for us. He takes difficult passages and, you know, does like a mother bird and chews it up so that we can digest it. You know, us poor, you know, weak spiritual beings can, you know, understand through, you know, th that it gets filtered through. So I think, I think that is, I, I think I would say on the one hand, as long as there is a kind of spiritual usefulness that, that even authoritative church figures like Schnorhalli would, would, would be fine with that. The caveat is then that it is the job in part of those who are tasked with authoritative interpretation to make sure that they are spiritually useful, right? Because the person listening to the Azan, I think, it is, is, it is spiritually useful, right? She's able to sort of meditate on you know, her place in the city and the role of her church and all these kinds of things through listening to somebody else's uh, you know, liturgical theological tradition. Mm 
Now, if somebody's interpretation of that was, you know, aha, I hear it's sign ta again, and we are, you know, you know, some kind of, you know, I don't know, imperialist project or something, like mm, that might be less sort of spiritually useful, right? And that's then wherein hopefully, you know, somebody around this person would would be able to sort of do some of that authoritative interpretive work. Does that answer what you're you're getting at? Yeah, thank you. Hakim. Chris, thank you very much. It's really refreshing to see uh, Jonathan as this uh, with semiotics. Uh, I want to push you a little bit about the, about the influence of theology of, in, 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 in re-emphasizing the, the theology. Because, I mean, wh why, why would you start narrating this uh, uh, or take the, the, the difference in Chalcedon as a starting point to narrate, to speak about when really, when you, when you look at, for example, the, the Eastern branch of the Chalcedonian churches uh, and how it resembles the Armenian one versus the differences between the two branches of the Chalcedon that are by far more different, different than uh, the, the, the Eastern and the, uh, you may disagree. It depends on who you ask. Yeah, <laughs> No, th thank you. That's a, it's a, um, you know, I mean, the, the other thing, right, is that, that um, you might notice that Augustine dies before the Council of Chalcedon, you know, so I mean, there are, there are, you know, a few little sort of, again, this is why I really like resonance. It sort of gets me out of some of these, these problems. No, I mean, you're, you're absolutely right. And, you know, for instance, um, you know, this tradition of writing commentaries on the liturgy, you, you see them everywhere, but, you know, if you were to sort of do a sort of proportional analysis, the, the, you know, the Roman Catholic is going to have by far the fewest, and then you've got a, a whole good number in, in the Eastern Orthodox churches. The Byzantine tradition has, has a tradition of this kind of commentary. But, you know, as, as, as Findikian points out, they start to do something different after a while, right? So, I mean, but, they're, but you're right, there is this sort of, you know, sense that, that there are some alignments there. And, and this is, I mean, it's a, it's a tough question, right? I mean, I think you're right. In some ways, this branch, you know, it does appear like these things are, are actually, you know, the Eastern, you know, modes of interpretation are, are similar. And sometimes I think, you know, if, if I want to sort of give um, kind of deterministic influences, I think a lot about the sort of the Cappadocian influence, right? I mean, which is obviously it's, it's, it's an influence across the board, but I mean, you know, I mean, the, 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 the three holy hierarchs and the way in which the, the kinds of, you know, that early sort of Cappadocian and, you know, Eastern theology um, continues to influence and be so central to both the, the, the Armenian and the East, you know, the, the Oriental and the Eastern Orthodox. That to me, I think is, is that's perhaps another place to, to begin the, the, the differences in the narration. Again, not that the Catholic Church is uninterested in the Cappadocian Fathers, but I mean that, that I mean, it, it, they just don't have that centrality. I mean, they really don't, you know, that kind of, you know, constant rehashing of, you know, I mean, in a way, you know, you, you have, you have, you know, medieval Catholic theologians, you know, almost, you know, rediscovering the Cappadocian Fathers in the same way that, you know, John Milbank and, and you know, contemporary theorists and theologians have rediscovered them. Whereas they sort of always were with both the Orthodox and the Oriental Orthodox um, theologians. So that maybe is one alternative starting point is to really sort of emphasize that. I mean, the, the, the cheap answer that is a non-answer, of course, is that it just doesn't, you know, the, the, that, that sign, you know, it's this picture right here. That's why I need to start where to go. This is why I have to start with Chalcedon right here, right? I mean, that's the... That's the, that's the, I mean, that doesn't give you an answer as to why not to do that, but that's the answer, I think, why I do, right? Because this, this structure is, is just, I mean, it's just so compelling when you put it up like that. Mm -hmm. and, and then to sort of, you know, it, it, it complicates my story there, Akeem, to, to see that the Byzantines are, are also doing these modes of interpretation. You're, you're absolutely right, it, it does. Um, 
So I, I, I do think, you know, I, my, my, my first answer is just to say that um, maybe certain kinds of Cappadocian influences in particular are, are one of these strands that sort of draw interpretive modes in the Eastern and Oriental Orthodox churches closer together. But the way I understood it, and I'm trying to still understand so much of what you've said, and it's, it's been so rich, is that it's, you know, it's not so categorical, right? You're, you're looking at um, the monophysites as a way to help you think about semiotics, right? So I think that you can, you know, resonances will work, but I think it's really what it, the purchase is that it helps you think about different ways in which we come to give symbolic value and, rep and you know, represents representation um, to everything around us, right? And I'm, I'm trying to think about, you know, how different what the sort of examples that you've given, not only, again, in, in a way, so in this abstraction of a lattice and a prism, right, that then also necessitates in some ways usefulness. Um, and I, I, I'm also like Michael, not sure about where this usefulness comes in because it has to come from sort of Christology. In some way, it has to be sal salvic, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so you're still stuck in, in, in a little bit with that, in, in my opinion, with the, the usefulness aspects of it. Mm -hmm. But I, I wonder where can you bring in, where does it fit in? It's, uh, where does the visceralness, where does the experience, right? Where does the agency, right, come in which such a semiotic theory doesn't really allow for, mm -hmm. um, and and you know, re hearing you, that it seems to me it's much more dynamic because you're really it, it's so much talking about a process, as you say. It's much more historical, right? Um, in that way, it sounds to me like Foucault. Um, but I so I'm just, so yeah. There's some of these ambiguities where then in um, the the formulation of a new social theory, right, or a new possibility to think um, around um, signs and symbols. Yeah, where does the the sensual? Where does the experiential? How can you bring that in, really? Yeah, no, and and thank you. And I, I think you know, I mean, one of the things that I, I struggle with is is making it, you know, like I. I mentioned the polysemy of the sign, but I, I took out for you know the interest of time certain other things. You know, I mean, you've 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 got you know difference. You've got you know you, I mean there's yeah. there's a whole lot of you know sort of post-structuralist theorizing on the mm -hmm. sign that that kind of gets to to a similar yeah. place, right? And I, I um, in the part that I took out, I called it sort of rhyming. You know, that that in the end it feels like it rhymes with those sort of post-structuralist insights, right? Um, and I think. You know, so one one of the purchases, obviously, is, as you've noted, is that that uncanny, right? So in a way, right? I mean, deconstruction is precisely deconstruction of of this, right? So in a way, there's a value to the rhyming aspect of tracing out a whole different genealogy. I I, I think, right? Because because deconstruction doesn't necessarily give you the uncanny, right? You're still you're, you're still starting from the same point. So the the kinds of unsettling that are possible by tracing out a totally different genealogy that gets you perhaps to a rhyming place. Th that I see, you know, there, there's, there's purchase in that. But um, I think what you, you know, what you point to then is, is where, where I'm still kind of trying to, to push myself. And, and actually today, mm -hmm. I, I think I, I, I feel like I've made strides from earlier versions because, um, you know, really working through kinds of what you know what what this looks like, and actually, I think you know Sunetzi maybe for me was the the most helpful today. You know, really thinking the incense, right, and seeing the way that those those things work. And so, I think one of them, one of the purchases maybe is the way that certain things or signs help go back and do the interpretive work for for other signs, right? Again, this does feel a little bit like deference, right? I mean, the endlessly deferred play that you know gives you meaning, if at all, mm -hmm. right? I, I think it, it does feel a little bit like that, but I, I think there's really something in the fact that, that a, 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 something like incense, which is not just a, a symbol, but is this sort of visceral thing that you feel, mm -hmm. is one, on the one hand, something that needs to be interpreted. You need work, you know, you need, you know, you need to be able to say, aha, yes, this, these are our prayers rising, as you know, most Armenian Christians will tell you. you know, but also, actually, that there's something in the embodied 
sensorial experience of the incense that becomes an impetus to interpretation. That I think is, a, I, don't, I don't necessarily see that in, in other kinds of sort of post-structuralist ideas of interpretation, right? I mean, sure, there's still the same kind of, you know, um, willingness for sign and signified and, you know, to mess with all those things. But I think, you know, I mean, the idea that a, a visceral sensorial encounter becomes both an impetus and an aid to further interpretation, that to me, that to me seems a little bit different. And that's where maybe usefulness, uh, utility in that sense, spiritual usefulness comes in because if you think of it like Sufis articulated it, so much depends on the space that you already are at. And all of the disciples will be at all very different kind of spaces, mm -hmm. right? And so your entry point into that kind of understanding um, and recognition, mm -hmm. really, right? Um, marks marks the difference of, of an, an ability of multiplicity of ways of, of experiencing and understanding. Mm -hmm. and, and it also is another connection back to sort of the, the, the ethical dimension, right? Which is, which is that you know, um, especially in a lot of this kind of this ethical turn in anthropology, you know, thinking about ethics as this sort of iterative, embodied sort of thing, as opposed to, you know, the categorical, um, you know, you, you, in order to be able to do certain kinds of interpretation, you have to already have built a kind of ethical relationship. So I'm, I'm very influenced by the work of Charles Hirschkin, right? And, and Hirschkin gives us this beautiful ethics of, of listening. And, you know, he, he talks about, you know, I mean, Quranic injunctions of an open heart, right? That, that there's actually a point in which, like, if you don't have the right ethical comportment, you can't understand, period, end of story. So there's a, there's a sort of ethical connection to not only hermeneutics at all, right? So not only is there a kind of ethical hermeneutics, but there is a, a sort of ethical prerequisite to the ability to inter interpret in some ways. And I think that, you know, that I, very much is, is why I, you know, just had that one little bit about ethics right around the question of usefulness, right? Because it's, it's again, the, the level of your cultivation, you know, the, how much sort of disciplined work you've done on yourself mm -hmm. is going to allow you to access different kinds of interpretation. Uh, These are great. I don't really have a question, but there's kind of a neat article by um, Nina Nogin, Nogin uh, okay. on incense in the Ottoman Empire. Uh, and she basically talks about how like Muslims and Christians communalized it in a very similar way, but that they burned different kinds of fragrances in hmm. mosques and in churches. It seems like way, way analogous to like leaving the major symbols in a similar way. But hmm. No, that's cool though, because you know, I mean, in a way, I mean, in a way though, that's the opposite of the musical mode, right? Because in the in the musical example, you have you know more or less the same sequence of physical frequencies that then splinter to you know these different kind of spiritual you know traditions. Whereas what you're saying is you know these two different sort of physical experiential experiences of the of the incense lead you to the same sort of spiritual interpretation. I think that's cool. In a way, it's a sort of it's a nice you know, mirror image almost. I'll definitely look at that. Thank you. Also, I'm not too sure if you've read um, uh, uh, Bouillet's uh, work on the rites of the temple hmm. mm -hmm. and the rituals, and he speaks heavily on the rites of Judaism and incense and how that has evolved into the Christian praxis cool. and experience. And uh, Louis Bouillet is an excellent source if you have it. I haven't. No, thank you. I'll definitely, I'll definitely look at that. And yeah, again, another one of the things I, I excised was, you know, in, in talking about how, you know, I, I don't want to claim that it's too unique. Is that, you know, I mean, Talmudic interpretation is is everywhere in these Armenian practices, mm -hmm. explicitly so. Actually, I mean, a lot of the the Dr. Urban is is kind of beginning to really draw out where and how they were explicit. But I mean, it's it's pretty clear that especially the earliest Armenian exegetes. Um, as the Cappadocian fathers were, were, were heavily, you know, not just Philo, who like many, you know, I mean, barely a Jewish exegete, according to, you know, many Jewish thinkers, but, you know, a long tradition of Talmudic interpretation is definitely influential on, on our, our way of doing things. So that, that would be great to, to read, you know, the sort of movement of 
you know, I mean, I, I mean, in the Armenian Church, the classic example, right, that I always learned is the vestments. You know, right, that are the, the, the clerical vestments are supposed to be a direct uh, reading of, well, of of Aaron, right, of Exodus, right, of you know, the, I mean, the, to the you know, kinds you can read, you know, what. God says Aaron is supposed to read and or wear in Exodus, and it's supposed to you know more or less correspond to what our our priest vests for for the liturgy. So, yeah, I mean that that would be great. Thank you. That's a great recommendation. Okay, then you're going to all join us on the 16th. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much, Chris. Thank you.